Okay, we've got a bunch of scientist names up here. The names are not super critical at this point. It's just kind of setting up the history behind it. Okay? So initially, we had triads. Did we talk about in this class why triads? No, okay. Why would, why would Dobreiner be looking for triads? The Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity. Nice. I like the enthusiasm, though. Okay. We've got the Holy Trinity. Okay. Just as Greg was presenting up here, good thing he didn't erase the board. What do we have up here? Logos, pathos, ethos, and he called it our triads. Right? Triads as a pattern is something that humans have been trying to discover and find for whatever reason, they're out there. Right? So Dahlbrenner, when he first went through and looked at the periodic table or all the elements out there and noticed that there were groups of three elements that had the same kind of chemical properties. Right? If we look at our periodic table, do we see groups of three anywhere on the periodic table on the wall? Yeah. No. Why? How did Dahlbrenner see groups of three then? Where do you see a group of three? What's that? Okay, we could say gas, liquids, and metals. Does that explain reactivities, gases compared to metals? Gases don't really apply to metals or solids or liquids. Okay. When we look strictly at the periodic table, do we see elements repeating in triads? Let's try that. No. Why did Dobreiner see elements repeating in triads? didn't have most of the periodic table. Okay? You get rid of most of the periodic table and you will see trends in sets of three because of common patterns on accessibility. This goes back to our upper left-hand corner, the abundance of those elements. Okay? If we look at the most abundant elements and look for triads, those are where they saw those triads in those systems. Okay? Turns out it's not perfect. A little bit later, we get Newlands coming through, and now we have 62, and he goes through and groups them according to sevens, okay, according to increasing atomic mass. So he says group one has these kind of characteristics, group two, these, three, these, and they're grouped roughly according to their atomic mass. Notice it says groups of seven. Okay. Remember, periodic table, simple at that time, we're largely looking at just the top three rows. How many columns in the top three rows? Eight. And yet, what did he group by? Seven. Sevens. Okay, what's going on there? Noble the noble gases weren't discovered yet. Okay. Ramsey discovered those when? What? Oh, gosh, like 19, no, 18. I forgot the year. No worries. Anybody else have <laughs> Ramsey? What year did he put the noble gases out there? Might be in the slide somewhere else. I don't remember. So the noble gases weren't there, so he organized according to groups of seven. He then went through and called this the law of octaves. Where have we heard of octaves before? Music. Music. Okay, music had octaves behind it. We're looking at kind of the spiritual aspect of building how we observe nature. We have this thing called music that someone has built a theory around okay, with octaves in it. We have the periodic table that kind of matches that. Okay. Octaves means eight. How does that match? But remember, at that point, did we have the noble gases? No, we only had seven. So why is it octaves? Well, when you get to the eighth note, it's like the same note that you started at. So right. there's only seven different notes. This goes back to music. I didn't know this, and it took me a really long time, and a lot of musicians trying to explain it to me and me not paying attention. Your eighth in your law of octaves is a repeat of the first which means there's really only seven. Why don't they call it the law of heptaves? Probably because heptaves doesn't sound as cool. But then there's half steps. Uh, don't, no, stop. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. Okay. But then some of them are like, like a whole step isn't like a, the same as like a whole octave. We can, we can worry about music theory outside of this class. Mendeleev came through right, and proposed his own version of the periodic table that had very similar properties as the previous. Okay, he looked at atomic mass, and we really give him credit for determining our current periodic table. Okay? And so he had the variety of columns. He associated them back to uh, 
chemical compounds from how they reacted with oxygen. And we have the periodic table as he's drawn it. Notice it looks pretty similar for the most part to our current one. Okay. There are some mismatches, but for the most part, it's pretty close. Okay. One of the things that stood out and why he ends up getting credit is sitting right in the middle of this. Where it says ECA. What do those ECAs mean? That there's a hole here, there should be something here. Okay? And not just there should be something here, it's it should react this way with oxygen. It should look like this. It should have this density. It should have this mass. Okay? Well, if it has all the information, why wasn't able to find it? Just because you know what something looks like doesn't mean you can find it. Okay? We could run all sorts of fun comparisons there. Murderers, I don't know, let's pick murderers. People that did, let's, okay, let's not do murderers. <laughs> bank robbers, okay? There are people that go out and rob banks. Is it just a question of, oh, I know what he looks like, so whoop, you're now in jail. No. no. What are those bank robbers now trying to do? Hide. Hide. They're evading the police at every step of the way. Our elements are effectively doing the same thing, but not as a conscious effort. It's just something about their properties makes them more difficult to find. Some of that could just be, all the way back to our very beginning here, could just be that, well, there isn't a lot of them around. Okay. We're not looking at a tiny little space and saying all of those materials are in just in this box. We're saying those are now scattered across the entire planet. Okay. We're looking at a situation where we take days or weeks to get information from different locations. Okay. Uranium isn't in the same concentration everywhere. There's areas where uranium is much higher in concentration. So we target those locations. Okay. We can think about diamonds. Where are diamonds typically found? Africa. We get Africa. We get some in Canada. We get some in Australia. They are kind of scattered all over the place, but we get very limited pockets in those other locations. Africa tends to have a lot of diamonds, which is why one of the things we're concerned about with diamonds is if they're blood diamonds, because it's fueling uh, wars. And there's, yeah, there's all sorts of other political aspects that go through this. Okay? But we don't see diamonds scattered everywhere evenly. They're in very particular pockets. Same thing's happening with our elements. It could very well be that where Mendeleev was located, the amount of those echoes at that location was so limited, couldn't find them. Okay. So it's not just a question of, I know it's there, but then also being able to find it. What does ECHA actually stand for? <laughs> ECHA is similar to, is the origin, I believe, on it. Okay. Um, so it's typically ECHA, like that first one I've got box, I believe is known as ECHA aluminum because it's referenced similar to aluminum in its characteristics. Okay? So this is why it's important. He went through and looked at silicon. Silicon's an interesting one. Or, sorry, not silicon. Silicon we found. That's relatively easy, because silica is found. You ever gone to the beach? Shells. Sand. Sand. Yeah. Silicon's all through sand. Silicon's a massive concentration everywhere. Right? But he went through and said, Eka silica exists. Right? It should be gray, should be 72 AMUs, should be 55.5 grams per milliliter, very high melting point, all those statistics. And when we look at our time frame, that was 1869, 1886, they actually discovered it. How close are those? Those are astonishingly close. And we're looking at, I can't do math, roughly 20 years. Okay. 20 years away. Your lifetime, from when someone said this exists, to somebody finding it and it, finding out it matched. Okay. That's a pretty impressive ability. That's the power of the periodic table. If we have the organization right, we have the ability to predict everything that can happen from it. That's why Mendeleev gets a lot of credit.
Kind of makes sense. Is this still, is there still a possibility that this will change or have we pretty much figured it all out? Is there a possibility it can still change? Yes. Right? We're at 118. What happens when you add one more proton? You're at 119. Is that a new element? Well, it doesn't match any of the other 118. I do have a new element. Okay? Where does that new element then populate the table? That's an interesting question. That refers back to the structure of the periodic table and where to find all those individual pieces. Okay? We aren't there yet. So once we understand the structure of the periodic table, we can talk about where we could bring some in. There's all sorts of questions about can we find more? I think if you think of the periodic table as a genre, like he's shown us three or four different models of it as new information has come up and we have that genre of our acting piece of red. If you think of the periodic table as changing, it is stable for now, but changing with new information or with the needs of the readers and the needs of the writers, that might be a good way of depicting that model. There's one argument that I would probably make here. Is it likely to continue to expand the periodic table? I would make the argument no. Why? Have we already discovered everything that will happen naturally? Uh, and that, again, we can't, we can't answer. All we can find is what we have access to. So there could still be something out there that we haven't found yet. Okay. If we take a look, starting at 93, every element thereafter is man-made. Okay. Why are those man-made? They don't stay together. What's not staying together? We're taking protons and jamming them into the same space. Okay, with one proton, not a real issue with stability. When we move up to, let's pick, I think it's Seaborgium SG-106. Okay, we're taking 106 protons and now jamming them into the exact same space. What are those all going to try and do? Get away from each other. So what do we have to do? Add a whole bunch of glue to glue it together. We take two marbles, we can glue two marbles together. Okay? If I want to now add another marble, I have to add more glue. Okay? As I continue to add marbles, I have to add more and more and more glue to hold it together. Okay? And this isn't just a, I can now wait for it to dry. This is, it must happen all instantaneously. Which means, by the time I add that last one on the outside <coughs> with a little bit of glue, what can you tell me about the glue on the inside? probably still wet, which then means unstable. it's unstable and it starts to fall apart. So we could potentially even make 119. Okay? It's probably going to fall apart. 120, probably going to fall apart. Okay? We can look at nuclear stability for a nuclear physicist. There are trends within that that show us that certain elements exist for longer than we would predict. And that's looking at nuclear physics effectively. And uh, kind of outside the scope of the class. And when it falls apart, is that classified as a radioactive? When it falls apart, that is known as radioactivity. And it falls apart in very particular fashions. So that starts at radio. When does it start? Everything above lead um, has radiation or has the ability to have radiation. Okay. As we continue to mess with the periodic table, uh, Somewhere up there. Oh, did I not even give him credit? Oh, that's harsh. 1894, we're looking for a time. Ramsey nails down our noble gases. Okay. Once we find one, we start to find all of the others. Okay. As we continue to add information, Mosley in 1913 discovered that nuclear charge increases by one for each element on the periodic table. Well, why didn't Mendeleev look at nuclear charge? Why? Do you Why? have the technology to observe that? Close. Yeah. How many subatomic particles were known in the time of Mendeleev? None. There weren't electrons, protons, and neutrons. There wasn't even charge established or proven at that point. Once we had charge discovered by Thompson in 1895-ish, okay, then we can start to advance and look for nuclear charge. Once we have that nuclear charge information, we notice that the periodic table is better organized according to the nuclear charge, not according to mass. Mendeleev only had mass, so that's how we ranked them. And if we look at the periodic table, 
do we see trends in mass? Hydrogen to helium, what happened to the mass? Increased. It increased to lithium. Increased. Beryllium. You'll notice that it increases really, really well up to iodine. Iodine's for sure an exception. I don't know if there's another one. Take a look at iodine. When it moves from tellurium to iodine, so we're referencing this, iodine has a symbol of I. Everybody found it on the periodic table? Tellurium to iodine, what happened to the atomic mass? It went down. By it went down. Not by a lot, but it went down. That's counter to Mendeleev's trend of using mass. Okay. If we use atomic number, what happened? It's on the right track. It's on the right track. It continues to move up. Okay. So the atomic number is a better indicator of our periodic organization. So we use the atomic number, not the atomic mass. Okay. So our periodic law content or concept just says that, again, increasing atomic number. Okay. Once we have a concept of electron energy levels, this comes from Niels Bohr in the end of chapter 4. Everybody read that, right? Everybody go like, that was the easiest chapter ever to understand? Orbitals, you're like, orbitals, yeah, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a challenge. Okay? So I want the concept of the periodic table addressed first before we go back and evaluate that. That's why we did this jump. Okay? But with that kind of discovery, we get the final formal organization of the periodic table. Okay? Because that concept of our orbitals is in the periodic table. It's already given to us. It's one of the, again, big powers of the organization behind it. So when we look at it, we get things known as groups and periods. The vertical column is our group or family. Our horizontal row is the period or series. Okay. Those are just nomenclature terms or naming terms. You just have to know what they mean. Okay. Group and family, up, down. Period or series, left, right. The most common that you'll hear is period, and the most common that you'll hear, hear is group. You need to know those terms and how they correspond to the periodic table. Okay. After that, we've got the periodic table, and certain columns pick up their own unique name. Why would they carry their own name? Do they share properties? They share properties. Not only do they share properties, they were so old when they were discovered that they've been around for long enough that someone went through and said, I'm going to name it Bob. What happened when we discovered there was a better way to name it? Right. Well, that old person said, I'm not changing how I'm naming it. You must call it Bob. Right. So the next person says, well, I had to call it Bob, so now everybody else must call it Bob, and so on and so forth, until now we have to associate the names with each of those columns or each of those groups. Right. The big ones that you need to know, the alkali metals, the alkaline earth, your noble gases, and the halogens. Okay. The alkali metals with only one word in front of metals happens to be in the first column. One word, first column. Hey, that works out pretty well. Alkaline earth, I wonder if my trend works. Second column, two words, alkaline earth. Okay. For roughly, I've been teaching, learning chemistry for... 15 to 16 years, I have only memorized those two and where they apply in the periodic table within the last year. That's how useful that information is, just so you know. You're still responsible for it. After that, the next big ones, okay, so that covers our group one and our group two. The next big ones would be your noble gases and your halogens. The noble gases start with helium. Why did it take so long to discover the noble gases? What's that? You got an idea, Ryland? Uh, just did not have the equipment to isolate, or I mean, it's partially equipment too. Why would we discover oxygen before the noble gases? Because it's more abundant. Abundancy. They don't react with anything else either. Reactivity is the key. Okay. Our noble gases don't react with things. Okay. How many of you in here are actual nobility? Oh, nobility. You are a king, queen, prince, or princess. Okay. Nobody. Why not? That's because the nobility is sitting off in their own freaking castle, getting their own private tutors, and not having to deal with the rest of the world. 
okay? Because they don't need to interact with the rest of us because they're better than us. Guess what the noble gases are? Same thing. Off in their own private world, getting their own private tutors, they don't have to deal with annoying chemistry professors. Okay? They don't react with things. Separate world. That's where the name noble is coming from. Okay? <laughs> this is fun. I get to keep throwing you on the spot. Is that statement true? The noble gases do not react with anything. Right. No, they do react with something. No, some noble gases do react. This comes back to how they react, which comes back to electron configurations. So we'll keep coming back to that and talk about why the noble gases might be more stable than the others. Halogens. Halogens are insanely reactive, so you need to, be, you need to know that name. Associate the name halogens with everything under fluorine. Okay. After that, there's two more that are on my list. Those two are only on there because I know them, <laughs> and I think they're fun to say. The nictogens, come on, that's kind of cool. That starts with nitrogen, and the other one, chalcogens. the chalcogens, also kind of a fun one to say. It's also really entertaining to watch people try and say them because it's just a mouthful of, chalcogens. what are those? Somebody had a that word, though. Yeah, and I don't know where the origins on them came from, but I just think they're cool to say. So let's go back to Mendeleev and his physical properties because it's fun. We just listed a whole bunch of facts. You might say, well, how can I get possibly tested on this? Well, let's take a look at how we get tested on it. Given the above information, what is a reasonable density for potassium? Okay. So I'll give you a minute. Talk to the people about where potassium is. So the whole point was recognizing that Mendeleev said there's trends behind these. So we find potassium, K. Well, if we look at the periodic table, it goes lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. Interestingly enough, in the table I've given you, it starts with lithium, sodium. Oh, look, that giant gray bar running through the middle is supposed to represent potassium. Okay. So what I can go through and do is look at the trend. What is the data telling me as I move down the column? What happens to the density? It gets bigger. Okay. So what value should I be putting here? 0.4? Why not? I want to find something between 0.97 and 1.53. Why? Because it's in the middle. What's it? it? What is it? What is it in the middle? Yes. Potassium. potassium is in the middle of sodium and rubidium. And if I go through and take a look at the general trend, I should be picking a density that is somewhere between those two values. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so I heard a lot of people just say an average. Okay. Other options behind this. How big did that jump? How much did this jump? Ballpark, that's about the same. Okay, it's not perfect. It goes up about 0.4. So maybe what I could do is right here do, which would give me a number at 1.4 something or other. Yeah, that gray was a horrible color. We should fix that. 1.4 something. That 1.4 guess, is it between those two numbers? Yeah, so that still holds. What about the 1.4 guess? Might you say, eh, I don't really like that so much. Because it's too close to... It's really close to the rubidium. Yeah. Okay. And so we might not put as much weight in that. We might say, well, let's take the average of our two answers. Let's go ahead and say it's at 1.3. Everybody okay with that? So what we've used is the data given to us extrapolated that data to fill in missing spots. This is what Mendeleev did. Does that make sense? <laughs> yep. So, let's make it a little bit easier. We could go through and put some multiple choice answers in. Those were the slides. It could have been like, why didn't you show me those multiple choice answers? They were on my slides, yes. Animations. Which of those answers would be your best choice? B. Okay. Okay, somebody, I'm going to look at footnotes, and footnotes are always dangerous. So let's, <laughs> let's pretend that those footnotes weren't there for the moment. Okay. <clears throat> so for those of you who didn't see those footnotes, good. Keep it. Ignore. Everybody okay with the question? Yes. You're using the logic of the data given to you to process through it. 
That's the goal. That is what we want you to do. You've created a solid hypothesis. You have the evidence to support that hypothesis. Okay. What would we then do in the real world? We would test it. I.e., we remove the gray bar and the density of potassium is 0 0.86. Does that make your logic wrong? No, your logic is sound. It's, that doesn't have a problem. That's how you need to work through a test, based off of solid logic all the way through. Why is this happening? We could come up with some other explanations. Say, well, something else is going on here. We want to figure out what that is. And we would go out and we would have to test for that hypothesis. Okay? The knowledge of why that is happening is beyond the scope of the class. We don't need to worry about it. So would B still be the answer? B would still be the answer. Given the, given the information supplied to us within the question. So it's meant to be misleading. Okay. Yes. You might be like, oh, well, why would you do that? Because the point of this is not the answer, it's the process to get there. Okay. How many of you are going to become chemists? One person. So the rest of you, why are you in this class if you're not going to become a chemist? I need the science. Somebody made me do it. Why did they make you do it? They don't want you to learn the content, they want you to learn the process. The content just happens to be the tool to figure out that process. Okay. So think about how it works, not that it works. Okay. That is a massive paradigm shift in how most students approach courses. Okay. That is not an easy thing to do, but that is what I am asking you to do and what we are working to get you to do by the end of this class. Thank you. It's only week three. Give me time. Oh, wow. Is that going, that little uh, caption, is it going to be still on there? Like, if you didn't have the answers, obviously, or even if you didn't have the answers. But you I would never put a caption like that and say, you had to read the footnote. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, chemical properties. Let's apply this again to a new situation. Okay. Members within a family also have similar chemical properties. So when we looked back at our densities, we saw a general trend moving through. We could use that trend to predict blank spots if there were blank spots. Okay, we can do the same thing with their chemical properties. As I move from lithium to sap, sodium to potassium to rubidium to cesium to francium, what do I notice about how they react with oxygen? I need two of those atoms for every one oxygen every single time. Okay? That is a valid trend to look at because why? Keep going. What do they have in common? Is there a tool that I could look at to evaluate and think, is there a pattern there that I could be looking at? So for those of you staring at the screens, you're looking at the wrong space. Pull your vision a little bit further back towards you, but not at me, the other direction. And where you should be looking would then be the periodic table. Where do you see sodium, lithium, rubidium? They're all in the same group. They're all alkali metals. Because they are all in that same column, I now know their chemical properties will be similar. So if, say, I hadn't discovered francium yet, and someone asked, what is the formula for francium after it's reacted with oxygen? Well, I could go back and look at how it reacted or how the alkali metals reacted with oxygen in the previous cases and say francium will likely be FR2O because it's in that same family. Kind of make sense? You ready for a really hard question? Okay. Write a possible exam question about predicting chemical properties. Right. What we're looking at right here is chemical properties. What I want you to do is come up with an exam question that could potentially evaluate that in any form. You want to do short answer, make it short answer. You want to make an essay, make it an essay. I will tell you right now that when I write it, it's a multiple choice. I will work through them. If I gave you beryllium, magnesium, and calcium, what is the next element? Uh, SR, what is it? SR, strontium. strontium. 
right? Did that involve looking at chemical properties? That not involved no, that just meant looking at the periodic table. So it's a valid question. You're getting at trying to recognize patterns and noticing that there is a trend within the periodic table, but that doesn't cover this chemical property aspect. Okay. What was your question again? Uh, so based on your knowledge of noble gases, does argon react with another element? Okay. Based on your knowledge of noble gases, does argon react with another element? Okay. That does fit everything within this. It's a little bit more challenging there. Our noble gases... We're the last column, and what do we say about the noble gases? They don't react. With much. They don't react. So you're asking, is, does argon react with anything? Well, if the rest of them don't, and argon's a noble gas, then no, shouldn't react. Okay. Here's my question. I want to know the formula for an aluminum oxide. So I take aluminum. And I take oxygen. I'm going to combine them. So I'll have some number of aluminum, some number of oxygen. Okay, I want to know what those X and Ys are. Al3O2. We'll get to that. Gallium, when it mixes with oxygen. Ga2O3. Magnesium, when it reacts with oxygen, is just MgO. Sodium, when it reacts with oxygen, is Na2O. And silicon is... SO2. Okay, I can guarantee you in our multiple choice answers, this is what we will have as choices. Al2O3, ALO, Al2O, ALO2. So, what do you think? Uh, what she said actually is not that. So. I believe you said AL three O two. Okay. The answer is AL two O three. Why? Because it's in the same group as. We go through and take a look at all of these elements. Silicon. Third row, uh, what is that? Fifth col fourth column, I can't count. Sodium, third row, first column. Magnesium, third row, second column. Gallium, third row, uh, sorry, fourth row, third column. Everybody see them? Aluminum, uh, third row, third column. Right? Got them all up there. Magnesium, sodium, silicon are all in the same row. Shouldn't that mean aluminum is also associated with that because it's in the same row? No. no. That's because our periodic table is organized according to groups or families, which represents the vertical column, not the horizontal row. Which means when I'm trying to predict aluminum's properties, I need to find the chemical formula for anything that matches aluminum. That would be boron, gallium, indium. Actually, I don't know that one. TL. Thallium. Oh, well. Thallium. Okay. So I would have to find anything that matched aluminum in that. Gallium's the only one in that same column. Gallium's formula is Ga2O3. Therefore, I'm going to predict aluminum is Al2O3 when it reacts with the oxygen. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So you're using the information given and the context that we know these elements are grouped according to similar chemistries. Right? Why do they have similar chemistries? That's another good question. But not yet. Periodic trends. Right? So we've talked about some of the trends. Columns have the same reactivity. There's other trends that can pull out of it. When we look at an atom, we can look at the size or the atomic radius. When we talk about size, what are we measuring? Okay. There's a couple ways that we could look at size. We could look at mass, or we could look at volume. We talked about this when we looked at atom size. 
Our atom size is dependent on what? The radius, what's the radius of it? I remember we scaled an atom up so that it was something that we could think about as far as size went. We said the atom, the size of an atom was the superdome, the nucleus was a marble. So it's electrons? The electrons are what's going to dictate the size. Okay? Because the electrons are on the outside. That's what prevents that atom from interacting with other things because the electrons shield that nucleus away from it. So when we're talking about size, we're talking about the volume of the atom, not its mass. Which then means I can ignore the number of protons and neutrons. The only thing I'll evaluate are the electrons. All right, so electrons are responsible for size. There are two trends in our atomic radii. What are those? Because you've read it all. No? Nobody read it? As we go down, what happens? It gets bigger. Hydrogen, we look at a neutral hydrogen atom, how many electrons does it have? One. One. If I look at a neutral francium? Francium, FR. 87. Because it has 87 protons based on the atomic number. If it's neutral, it has to have an equal number of electrons. Which one has more electrons? One or 87? 87, which was francium. Francium having more electrons will thereby be... More mass. Larger, not mass. Okay, I don't care about mass. All I'm looking at are the number of electrons. And arguably, if I looked at the mass difference based on the number of electrons, minuscule. Okay. So down a column, atoms get bigger. Okay. Why do they get bigger? What's that? You got it. We actually said the answer a couple times. They accumulate what? More protons. Nope. Protons have nothing to do with size. They accumulate more electrons. The more electrons we have, the bigger we get. That trend makes a lot of sense. Left to right. So I move lithium to neon. What happens to the number of electrons? It goes up, right? So what happens to the atomic size when I go left to right on the periodic table? It should go up. And yet, what does it do? It goes down. Wait, I add more electrons, and I get bigger, down a column. I add more electrons across a row, and I get smaller. Anybody see kind of a logical gap there? should hopefully recognize that our explanation for why atoms are getting bigger is wrong. We're missing some key piece of information about our electrons that prevents our analysis from working. Okay. Let's see, do I have a nice picture? i got a nice picture. So look down a column, bigger. Left to right, our elements get smaller. Right. Any questions about that? Neither you did, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, so but we can't visibly see like the atomic radius of it on the periodic table. True. We do not see atomic radius on the periodic table. So why are we looking at trends? What if I want to know something about size? Well, that would mean I'd have to go look it up. Or I can memorize a trend. I memorized the lower left-hand corner, francium, is the largest element, and helium is the smallest. With that information, I can now predict everything about size, or most trends in size, without having to look them up. Okay? And that's one of the key things that we try to do with our periodic table, is come up with trends so that I don't have to look up more information. The periodic table has a lot of that information buried in it. I want to keep it there. Well, access it, but not have to look up more. What are you going to suggest? That's basically what I was asking, if that trend went all the way across the periodic table. There are always exceptions. That's right. why it's called a trend and not a rule. But in okay. just general. What will you be tested on? The trend. The trend. Okay. I don't expect you to know the exceptions. And arguably no one should. But. Okay, I'm not sure how to word it properly, but could it be like... um. 
how available they are to um to like join with another element. Now there's an interesting theory. Maybe it's dependent on how willing they are to react with other elements. Okay. And so your th theory is what? The smaller, the less available? The smaller is less available, yeah. Because they, um, they rather take electrons than to give electrons. Like okay. In a sense. So fluorine on this, being the smallest, should be super reactive or less reactive? Fluorine is not a noble gas. Fluorine is a halogen. Fluorine is one of the most reactive nonmetals out there. Right? So reactive that if we try to react with organic materials, it explodes very violently. Not, not fun to mess with fluorine. But yet we move one step further to the right, and what happens? Noble gas doesn't react. Noble gas doesn't react. Mm. So our reactivity trend doesn't match. I know that the electrons going around the, the, the nucleus, that it gets smaller because of how denser or how big. Orbitals are what are going to dictate this trend. Okay, so the yeah. orbitals in the bottom left are okay. Until we understand orbitals and where electrons are allowed to exist, the trends for atomic size completely nonsensical. It doesn't make sense. We can't come up with a rule that works because we don't understand where the electrons can exist, which is why what we should now do would be go back to chapter 4 and look at our electron orbitals. Before we jump back into chapter 4, this is an important slide. This shows the trend for atomic radius and metallic character. Okay. So why might I show this? Well, on the exam, you'll probably be asked questions about atomic radius. Okay. Does the periodic table show anything about atomic radius? No. Does the one up here show something about atomic radius? Yeah, that's pretty easy. I can now say, well, if I want to compare, say, it's easier to look at rubidium, rubidium to fluorine, that I know fluorine smaller than rubidium. Okay. Because of that trend. That trend is something that you are required to bring into the exam. You need to know that. If you don't know it, you can't answer the question. Okay. That is a new piece of information, a fact. Okay. Interesting problems with facts and your brain is that what do you tend to do with them? Forget them. So maybe when taking the test, the first thing that you should do would be to write down some facts. Write down some facts. Okay. Facts on atomic size are a good one. Because it can be done by just writing atomic size decreases and two arrows on the periodic table that you have on your exam. You now don't have to memorize it when it shows up in the multiple choice. What do you do? Oh, I have a periodic table that I wrote the answer on. Now I just have to read my work. That's what you should be doing. Okay? I don't expect you to memorize things permanently. I expect you to memorize them for at least long enough to write them down. Kind of make sense? Okay. Why write it down right away and not wait until you see the question? In the process of finding that question, what are you reading? More information. Other questions, and arguably also other answers. The majority of the answers on a multiple choice test are what? Smaller. Wrong. Right? which means you will be spending most of your time reading wrong answers to then have to memorize a trend. You will only screw up the trend the later into the test you write down the trend. Write down the trend right away. Don't have to worry about it. Make sense? Will there be other trends that run counter? Yes. This is why you also write them down. Okay? With that, our wave nature of light, we get back into chapter 4. Okay? Light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's composed of wavelengths and frequencies and all these energies and fun stuff. whoop de doo Moves at a speed of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. If you have to move into a more advanced chemistry course, you will look a lot more in detail about the mathematics behind those relationships. As it stands for this, there's really no value added to looking at this beyond a wavelength measures peak to peak, and the frequency is the number of peaks you get within a given range. 
Okay. So with that, let's move on. Okay. Our energy spectrum. Visible light is a tiny, tiny section of electromagnetic radiation. All right, and this is something that usually gets floated out there and everybody goes, oh my god, electromagnetic radiation, gamma rays, I'm going to turn into the Hulk. Okay. I don't ever want to be encounter those electromagnetic radios. It's how we see. If we don't have electromagnetic radiation, we literally cannot see. It's part of the same spectrum. Why are we less concerned about our visible spectrum than we are about gamma rays. Yeah. Okay. Is Ryland particularly concerned with me standing here like this, my fist right next to him? Why not? I'm aware of your presence. I can see you. Okay. What if we did something along these lines? <laughs> you might start to get a little more concerned, right? Until maybe I start, you know, you know. Uh -huh. now you're getting a little more nervous. Why? Why are you getting more nervous when I do that as opposed to when I'm really, really close to you? Uh, you have more space to build. Momentum. Why is it not going to hurt as bad? There's the word, energy. There's energy associated with it. When we look at gamma rays, they are extremely high in energy. When we look at visible spectrum, that energy is only enough to cause a little molecule in our eye to go click. That's it. The rest of our body says, oh, click means red. Quick. Tell them there's a red object there. Okay, that's it. Gamma rays are more like, click, I'm melted. Okay. Significant difference in energy. Okay. We can correspond that back to... Uh, our wavelengths and our frequencies and all of that. Really what I want you to get out of this is looking at our, our energy spectrum and trying to decide which is higher or lower in energy. Okay. How do I know red is lower in energy than blue? Okay, the wavelength. So you want to memorize the wavelength. What is the wavelength for red light? Too long. So it doesn't work. Try again. Red is lower in energy than blue. The suggestion was... I need to know the wavelength. We don't know the wavelength, so that doesn't help. I want something else. Could just straight up memorize it. Okay. What's the next signal after red? What's the next part of the electromagnetic spectrum? The infrared. What is the next part of the electromagnetic spectrum after violet? Ultraviolet. I step out into the world and expose to the sun in Arizona, and I walk out, and I go, oh my God, protect me from ultraviolet, ultraviolet light. Why? It's damaging to your skin. Why is it damaging to your skin? It has more energy. Blue is closer to which high energy particle? The ultraviolet. Blue is higher energy. When I step outside, I don't slather sunscreen on to protect myself from the infrared or red light because what's wrong with slather? There's no wrong with <laughs> Red, being close to the infrared, I'm not as concerned about. That's not as high energy. I now have a tie that I can use, all based off of our glorious sun. So, Praise be. I'm confused why <laughs> they use like, those kinds of colors, because usually like, red is associated with, like, oh, I'm burning. I'm gonna, no. Yeah, that's a good question. We have a... I need some English words here for context... <laughs> for changing what those things mean. Red in most situations seems, seems to mean hot, and blue or purple means cool. Yeah. It's like our predispositions to those colors. We have somehow associated those colors in different patterns to mean different things. Different context, different result. Guess which context is correct? This one. <laughs> this one. Science wins because of math and numbers. Your preconceived notations of what red and blue meant were useless. <laughs> Science. Your reality okay. is broken. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. What are the colors in the spectrum? The rainbow. Good answer. Someone's been listening to my lectures ahead of time. Why do you say the rainbow? What other colors might you say in that question? 
Blue. Indigo. Magenta. Red. Orange. Yellow. Green. I can't even see that. Okay. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Also known as our Roy G. Biv, for whatever reason, if you needed to remember the colors within the rainbow, that's what we would reference. Where does red begin and orange start? What? Where does red end and orange start? In the middle. So right here. Orange is the color is right there, right? In between pure red and pure orange. Where's pure red? The very, very, very end. What's the very next spot? Red with a little bit of something else. Okay, when we say red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, okay, those are arbitrary human lines. We've gone through and said, this color is now decided to be violet. This color is indigo. This color is blue. Those are human additions to the rainbow. The rainbow covers all light, all colors. Okay? So when we think about our electromagnetic spectrum, it is a continuous spectrum of all things. It is not composed of the individual colors, okay? or each individual color. Every slight change in the wavelengths generates a new color that is slightly moving away from the ones near it. Okay? What does that mean for us when we now move into the science aspect of this? All right? Well, this gets back to people being bored right, with vacuums and saying, well, and electricity for that matter. You give people a vacuum and electricity, they just do all sorts of weird stuff. Right? They took a vacuum, they took all the air out of it, and they said, well, I'm just curious what would happen if I put 22,000 volts through my arm. Whoop, I died. Okay, I wonder what would happen if I put those 22,000 volts through an element. Why not? Let's see what happens. Okay, so they take a, a tube, we remove everything from it because we don't want any contaminants. We put in only hydrogen. Now we say, ha, ha, hydrogen, have 22,000 volts. zippity doo -dah. What happens? starts glowing, and we get neon lights. Okay, so the colors that we associate with neon lights are merely elements in their gas state that we are now shoving a cattle prod in and zipping them off into the ether, if you will. Okay, and that's giving off a colored light. And if we do that for hydrogen, we get this kind of purpley looking light. Okay, well, someone then said, well, I had this fancy little rock, and when I put that rock near white light, it spread out, and I could see... A rainbow. Cool, look at the rainbow. What happens if I now shine that purpley light onto that rainbow? Okay. In theory, what we might see would be, you know, all the purple lights, okay, or the range of purple light that was possible for that purple color. Instead, that is what we see. We see a single line in a purple range, we see a single line that's blue-green, and we see a single line that's red. But the light I'm seeing is purple. Why am I seeing only those single lines? That doesn't make sense. What's going on? In the complete composition of them, that's what we see. But why am I not just seeing a purple section, just a whole section of light that is all purple? Why is it only showing up as a single band? There's a man that's been listening to the conversation. Because science. Something is happening to the hydrogen. I've given it 20,000 volts of electricity, high energy electrons. And somehow or another, the hydrogen atom interacted with those electrons, and it changed its state. It absorbed that energy. But it's now at a very high energy state. And what happens when things reach a very high energy state? If we held you really high up in the air, eventually what happens to you? You fall. We return to that low energy state. But that means the energy has to be released somehow. In the case of our atomic line spectrum, that energy is released as light. We shove our electric energy in, and it spits out 
light energy. That light energy is not coming out in a continuous band of colors. It's coming out as distinct lines. Okay? Those distinct lines have to correspond to something that is happening within the atom. Okay, well, what did I do? I gave it a bunch of electrons. So more than likely, what's happened when I've pumped this in is I've changed the energy of my electrons. When those electrons change their energy back to their ground state, I'm seeing this light emission. Why is it weird to see distinct bands? Okay. If I went through and kicked each of you, okay, some distribution of energy, right? Okay. And we looked at the distance you moved. Okay. Would all of you move the same distance after each kick? No. no. Why not? You all weigh something slightly different. Right? So even if I give the exact same force each time, you're all going to move to different levels. And right? if I kicked enough people, what we would see is a spectrum, a full range of all the possible distances based off of your weight that I could have kicked you. When we do the same thing with electrons, they only jump to particular locations. So that's if I kicked you, all of you in this classroom, and then there were only three populations. Excuse me, that was weird. Right? Three populations. Okay, one population moved one foot further. further. Okay, one population moved a foot and a half. Another population moved three feet. Okay, nothing in between. I kicked Rylan. He went one foot. I kicked Hannah. She went one foot. Why? Center of gravity, don't bring center of gravity in. Okay, for our example, yes, we look at the raw physics of kicking people. Yes, we'll have to worry about center of gravity. We don't have to worry about that here. Okay. Why are they only going certain steps? They're running out of energy to distribute. The electrons can only exist at those positions, period. When I kick you, you either don't move, or you move to one foot, or you move to a foot and a half, or you move to three feet. Those are the choices. Okay. That's really weird. Because if I went through and kicked you, you would all move, you know, variations of that. Why are you only going to discrete spaces? Well, that is where we come up with Bohr, and Bohr says, okay, what that means is the electrons can only exist at a distinct energy level. Okay? So that when I kick the electron, if it's chilling in this first energy level, okay, if I give it 20,000 volts, it has enough energy that it could jump to the next energy level. When that electron is now done hanging out at the higher energy level, it can return. As it returns back down, it emits light that light will correspond to the energy of that gap. But even if I give that electron a little bit more energy, it can only go to that level. It will never go a half level. To get it to move up another level, I have to hit it even harder to get it to move up. Now when it comes back down, it could come back down in steps, in which case light, light, or it could come back down in one giant leap, light. Oh, that was the wrong button. You are an evil device. <laughs> so are you saying like the number of colors that you see or the number of electrons and whatever? The number of colors we see correspond to the number of electron jumps. Okay. Okay. In what? In the atom that you're charging below. What are our eyes seeing? Visible light. We're only seeing the electron jumps that correspond to visible light. Are there jumps that could be outside that? Yes. yes. Why don't we see those? Because they're not visible, <laughs> they're not visible light. Right? But the biggest part of this is that Bohr comes through and says we have quantized energy levels. Our electrons can't just exist as this sea of free-floating nonsense around it. They exist at specific locations. Right? 
and particularly specific energies, not locations. This is what's known as our quantized theory. This is what gives us orbitals. Steps are quantized. When you go up the steps, what happens if you only do half a step? You fall, okay? Because you're not allowed to exist at half a step, and science comes through and says, sit down. Right? Electrons can only exist at those half steps. We can't be anywhere on that ramp. A rainbow is continuous. We've got all the colors in between. An atomic line spectrum is discrete. Bohr, you should remember, for being a discrete gentleman. <laughs> as long as you remember, booze are okay. So that is our evidence for our energy level. If we go back and look at hydrogen, right, and this is where we'll end, I promise. We have our first energy, our second energy, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh energy level. Turns out we have seven energy levels. Any rows on the periodic table? Rhymes with heaven. There are seven, interesting. Seven energy levels. If I take hydrogen and stick it with 22,000 volts, what will end up happening is the electron at that first energy level will jump. Okay? It will jump potentially to the third energy level, the fourth, the fifth, even the sixth, seventh energy levels. When it is at the third energy level, if it makes the jump back down to the second, it emits light, and rather visible light. If it makes the jump from the fifth to the second, it emits visible light. So, you can, because it's purple, it also contains the other, like, gaps. So, the blue, green, has to be there within the purple, because it's going from the... the, the Not necessarily. You can Not necessarily. Because, because we could decide that you can't make that jump. Is that where the quantum jumping comes, or it goes from like the fifth to straight to the first? Or? Quantum jumping is a different process about this. But the transition from the fifth to the second gets us visible light. The transition from the third to the second gets us visible light. Which of those jumps is bigger? The, the fifth to the second, right? If that's a larger jump, what does that mean about the energy? It's more energy, which means it is more, which, more like which color? Blue or red? Oh, blue. It should be more like the blue end of our spectrum, or our violet end of the spectrum, because it's a larger jump. Look at the matches. It's exactly what it's doing. And with that, 